October 1st, 2019 marks the 70th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. 70 years ago, Chinese leader Mao Zedong proclaimed the founding of the People's Republic in the heart of Beijing. Since then, China has witnessed miraculous changes in every layer of its society, but also in terms of its engagement with the rest of the world. But what has China's development meant to the rest of the world, and what can we gauge about the China of the future by looking at its accomplishments over the past seven decades? Welcome to this special edition of The Point, coming to you from Beijing. I'm Li Xin. Joining me for the discussion in the Beijing studio are Jack Pakalski, founder and managing partner of JFP Holdings, a merchant bank, Hana Ryder, CEO of Development Reimagined, a consultancy, and Dr. Yu Tong Li, head of the Center for Sustainable Agricultural Mechanization at the United Nations Economic and and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. Welcome to The Point, and thank you very much to join, joining me, uh, to join me on this very special occasion. So China is now the second largest economy in the world. Uh, we have been able to take care of 1.4 billion people, not just to um, feed them, but feed them rather well, and uh, um, a, a host of other accomplishments. Um, let me underline that uh, all of these was achieved without waging a war against anybody, without a single slave being traded, without a single colony being exploited. So sometimes we tend to take it for granted, see China the way it is and think that that's just the way it should be. So Hana, let me go to you first. How big of a deal is it that 1.4 billion people, one-fifth of humanity, is actually living a self-sufficient and peaceful life? Well, I think it's a huge deal. Um, it has uh, meant a huge change for a lot of people, especially in the rural areas. And here in Beijing, even, we see a huge transformation, not just recently, but also, obviously, over the 70-year period. Um, that said, of course, that's what's here in China and the rest of the world. There are of course, even within China, there are still challenges. Uh, at the same time, the rest of the world also has some major challenges still to accomplish. So mm. it's important to explore how that happened, how these achievements have, have been made, but also, indeed, the challenges yeah. that China had to overcome in order to get there. Sure. Um, at this moment, uh, we do want to we do want to take stock of what has been uh, accomplished to you know to start the conversation, Dr. Lee. Um, how big of a deal is it for you as a Chinese working within the United Nations system? You have a global perspective. How do, for instance, the UN system or your colleagues in the UN system look at the, this case of China? Yes, uh, at the staff of the United Nations located in Beijing, we have very deep impression of the remarkable progress made by Chinese government. Uh, during the previous decades, we have made uh, uh, extraordinary progress uh, to increase the incomes, and that's uh, uh, let the people get rid of the poverty tremendously. That's, uh, I think uh, during this process, we can uh, learn a lot of experiences and a good practice to show to other people mm. outside of China that uh, China really make good efforts to get a, a huge amount of population out of poverty. Yeah. That's our common efforts. Yeah. Um, Jack, do you think it has been talked enough on the international press, for instance, uh, the kind of um, things that China, the Chinese people have managed to achieve? I mean, 1.4 billion, it's very easy to say. Two seconds, it's gone. Right. <laughs> but to really feed 1.4 billion people and keep them relatively happy. I think it's hard for people outside China to really understand and imagine what's happened over the last 70, you know, 70 years. I mean, not only have a billion four people now have a much better life within China, but the development of China has had a tremendous impact on the rest of the world. First of all, it's created a big new growing market, which has benefited countries around the world, Asia Pacific, and so forth. And also, I always say that uh, you know, with the development of China, you got 1.4 billion more people thinking about the big problems and how to solve them: environmental problems, health problems and so forth. So, and, and we're now starting to see that in terms of technological development in China. So I think the impact of China's development has been tremendous, not only 
for the country itself, but also for the global mm -hmm. economy. Mm -hmm. Well, I was reading history book. I'm a big fan of history book, and I was reading about you know the history of Homo sapiens, how mm -hmm. <laughs> they walked out of uh, um, East Africa about 70,000 70, years ago. That's the common w uh, understanding at this moment. So if we really zoom out and look at human history from such a you know a, a wide angle, what is this 70 years of peaceful life for one one-fifth of Homo sapiens on this world mean for human species, for this planet? Any guess? <laughs> Have you ever thought for, about it this you know, way? For most of my early career, you know, uh, uh, of the 6.8 billion people, however many people there are in the world, you know, really only one billion lived in what you would consider a developed economy. And I think what's happened over the last 70 years with China's development and its impact, you now have maybe half of the world's population, all these emerging economies are growing. So it's a big, big you know, impact because you now have not just the population in China, but the population in, in emerging economies, you know, really developing and, and you know, to a large degree, you know, be, because of what's happened in China. Mm. What, how, how has that been possible? I mean, <coughs> for instance, from the point of view of agriculture, you're talking about agriculture mechanization. Um, the agricultural revolution, for instance, uh, helped uh, Homo sapiens to mm -hmm. <laughs> produce uh, food on a much larger scale. Of course, mm -hmm. it also caused a famine because when you were collecting food in the forest, you mm -hmm. didn't really suffer from famine and drought and, and lack of harvest. But uh, how has China's ability to feed 1.4 billion mm -hmm. people really impacted the well-being of, uh, again, Homo sapiens as a species? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, in the agriculture sectors, uh, especially for agriculture mechanization, China has developed a lot uh, in the uh, past uh, 70 decades, um, especially in the euro areas, uh, within the new technologies and the new equipment and machineries. Uh, so uh, we, for China, it's not easy to feed 1.4 uh, million and get rid, uh, get rid of the poverty elevation in the euro areas. I think this uh, can be copied in other regions, African, Asia Pacific. And um, agriculture ma uh, machineries could link the traditional agriculture and mm -hmm. the modern uh, development. So it's helped the people get rid of the poverty and the secure the food security in China and in the region and globally. So that we can uh, transfer our thoughts and the good idea, even innovative technologies to the people that most need it in other countries. So, so if, I, if I asked you what factors allowed China to rise so fast to, to be able to achieve what it has achieved, what would you say? What, what would, how would you summarize that very important factor? What you want to replicate to the other countries? Not machines, but what is it? Mindset, open-mindedness, mm -hmm. hard work, resilience, what is it? Yes. Uh, first is the uh, policy formulating, the right policies. The and right, the right policies. Yes, the right path. And then we should find out what's the uh, urgent needs of the euro areas or in the, of the people. We strengthen the resilience not only to the natural disaster, but also some uh, climate change and the sustainable development they are facing. So sometimes they need the capacity building a study tour. We help them. We have uh, co-organized uh, projects with other UN agencies in China. Mm -hmm. What they are facing is the lack of the awareness of new technology. Mm -hmm. So we bring them mm -hmm. out to see what's happening uh, uh, along the or China and also of China. Um, this, this, the right policy is very important. Mm -hmm. um, how come China is able to do that? And for a country of 1.4 billion people, mm -hmm. very different needs, mm -hmm. and nobody knew how to develop the economy, right? We, we were, there was no textbook to follow, there is no mentor to ask help from. There are, uh, of course, there are the United Nations and our friends from around the world, but how? Mm -hmm. How much of a deal is it for the Chinese government to be able to formulate the right policies or more or less the right policies and adjusting them along the way in order to achieve what they are? I want to come back, in answering your point, I also want to come back to this question about what does it mean historically uh, for what's different about China's growth path I thought it was a difficult question. It so was a no, 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 I want to come back because I, I think it is an important question. It is important for us to think about it because 
I mean, fundamentally, the way that people think about it is the pace, right? The pace is much faster. Mm -hmm. And of course, you mentioned some other points, you know, lack of you know, colonialism and so on, um, slavery, etc. And that's helpful. Those things had been happening in the past and China wasn't directly associated with them. So at the same time, there, at that once China was, as the PRC, there were other mechanisms in the rest of the world, for example, the existence mm. of the UN as well, which were ab China was able to learn from those, mm. uh, those mechanisms, look at other policies that were being used around the world. Special economic zones were not a Chinese invention, although they were very successful in China. The first one was actually in Liberia in Africa in 1971. Mm. So uh, these, are, uh, these are a number of... You know, the great thing was that you know China is somehow the government's very well organised uh, in order to be able to pull together those lessons, mm -hmm. being able to look at other experience around the world mm -hmm. and use the best of that uh, mm -hmm. in this country. And of mm -hmm. course, um, 1.4 billion people is not just a difficulty, it's an asset too, right? Yeah. Uh, having those numbers of people. Yeah. It's very interesting because um, one of the things that really made Homo sapiens stand out, and I have keep coming back to that point because I think it's really fascinating, mm -hmm. uh, as one of the historians pointed out, is our ability to organize mm -hmm. ourselves. And you mentioned the word organization, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, particularly important for China and probably also how the Chinese system worked because we were able to mobilize, mobilize ourselves behind the same goals and then mm -hmm. put into practice the kind of directives or policies or ideas. Um, Jack, what is your understanding? Do you, do you see it this way as well or yes, is there uh, any other way to uh, look at it? I think clearly the, uh, the policies the government has had since 1978 with, you know, with the open door policy and mm -hmm then the special economic zones, the emphasis on infrastructure. All of those things have been very, very important for laying the, you know, the groundwork. And how you know, the Chinese leadership figured that out, I, I can't tell you. I'm not a, you know, I'm not, I'm not a well, psychologist. What's your impression? But yeah, your impression working but, and living in China and doing business with Chinese people and so on. But you know, I think the leadership has been very pragmatic. It's also been very open-minded, but at the same time, it hasn't really done anything too dramatic at one time. Mm -hmm. Always taken the step-by-step -step approach. So I think the combination of the pragmatism, mm -hmm. the willingness to look around the world to see what's worked somewhere else mm -hmm. and to try to use it in China, but not all of a sudden change the whole country or the whole economy based on one concept to see how it works mm -hmm. and then if it works, extend it to the rest of the country. Yeah. Well, when they did, they, made, they suffered, I think, yes, when they, when they had right. these kind of radical... Uh, policies they quickly had to learn from the consequences but uh, um, how I want to come back again uh, a little bit to the kind of implications of uh, the China that is neither poor nor unstable what would the region have been um, or the world at large have been had China not been able to stand on its own Dr. Li Thank you, Liu Xin. Uh, as uh, Han and Jack mentioned, that now China become more open to the world and pay much attention to the international cooperation, especially cooperation with the United Nations. Actually, for the United Nations, we have the 2030 uh, Sustainable Development Agendas, which are aligned with our Chinese uh, national uh, priority strategy, the uh, federal let, let me put the question this way. If yes. China had not met, for instance, the Millennium development mm. goals, mm -hmm. right, lagging behind in all of the major indices, mm. what would the region be like? Um, without the uh, Chinese contribution to the poverty elevation, I think the world will not uh, uh, develop so rapidly. I think with Chinese contribution of the poverty elevation, I think the SDG goals has been uh, uh, easily to be uh, achieved, accelerating the progress of the sustainable development goals. Mm. So Chinese really make a very big contribution to that. Okay, we're going to take a very short break, and you have been watching The Point on a very special edition talking about 70 years of the People's Republic of China. We'll be right back after this short break. So we were talking about um, what an unstable, undeveloped China would mean for Asia, for the world. Jack and Haina, please uh, jump in here if you can, from an African perspective or from the United States perspective. If China has not done well, uh, what, would, what would have been the consequences for the United States, for Africa, 
will the United States have been better off? For instance, uh, now that they have been complaining about China's rise, what would have been the consequence for America had it been the other way around? Well, I think it would be a you know, much different place. I mean, I think what China's done for the United States has created a big market for products and technology and so forth. And if you look around the world, there are very few other countries that really are big enough to make a big impact, to move the needle, so to speak. But China is so big and its development has been so, you know, so, you know, so great that it's created a big, vast new market for, for, you know, for U.S. companies. And, you know, for all the talk about China not opening up, when I first came here in 1993, the only industry in which a foreign investor could have majority was automotive components. Today, the, you know, the, you know, virtually, you know, foreign investors, foreign companies can own 100 percent of virtually any type of company in the United States. So, uh, you know, so I think that that's created a lot of new opportunities mm, mm. For, for companies in the, and people from the United States. Yeah. In terms of Africa, what would, well, be, what would have been the picture? So the point now we're at is that you know, there's still four, just under 400 million people still living in poverty on the African continent, mm -hmm. 700 plus uh, overall in the world. Um, and China's a very small proportion of that now. 160 you know. million, that's mm -hmm. our number. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, yeah, so a very, very small proportion. Uh, now, what that means is obviously that, that the focus on poverty reduction can be in other countries in terms of the international system, can be focusing on other countries. But, the, but that also means that China's own development has been very strongly linked with, for instance, the US has also been linked with other developed markets, European and so on. But for African countries, for instance, and mm -hmm. um, perhaps to more of a degree for the Southeast Asians mm -hmm. and so on, there's been less of a link. So mm -hmm. you, you find things like Africa only makes up 4% of Chinese trade. Mm -hmm. uh, similarly, 4% of Chinese tourists go to Africa. So mm -hmm. what China now represents is not just in a sense, inspiration and thinking about, well, how can we get there as fast as China did, or perhaps even faster? Mm -hmm. It also represents a potential new market for African countries, and I think that is where the, that's where people are looking ahead and looking over this 70 years, well, what's the future? But my impression of China's relationship with Africa is a bit more than just the 4% of trade. Um, I don't know um, how you would characterize relationship, for instance, you know, the kind of support that China and uh, Africa has always had traditionally. And then uh, let's not forget China has always been a developing country as well. So it's only by a couple of the decade or two or three, I would say China is on the place to start to feed back into Africa or more into Africa yes. and its model is considered to be relatively successful so that African countries are paying more attention to the Chinese or, the uh, way of doing things. The, the political relationship has been there for mm. a very, very long time. Even when China was not part of the UN, African countries were there with, with, with China. Um, the uh, original agreement around foreign uh, foreign support and what the principles of foreign, foreign support are back in 1955. You know, African countries and, and China were there, the ones that were not colonized at that point in time, were there together, of course. There was a very much the politics. The economics, however, mm. is just not yet. Just barely starting. Just, yes, sta just exactly. taking off. It is so. at, at, the, at okay. the point of departure. Mm. Um, in terms of uh, looking into the future, you know, on the basis of what has been achieved over the past 70 years. Mm -hmm. um, at this moment, we had a very precarious moment because um, a lot of worries, especially because of the relationship between China and the United States. And actually, UN Secretary General Mr. Guterres was warning against a possible future where the world is fractured into two camps, right? One led by the United States, one led by China. So looking ahead, what kind of future um, could China actively pursue. Um, Jack, I want to get your perspective there because China will not stop peacefully rise itself, will not stop trying to develop itself. But on the other hand, it seems the United States is determined that China must not be replacing the United States as the most developed country or the most powerful country in the world. What's going to happen? I don't know. Maybe I'm the optimist in the crowd, but I, I really <laughs> think that this is just 
something that's kind of you've been building for a long time. And the way I look at the United States and China, and I've you know over the last 25 years, is the two countries have really been developing independently, kind of like ships passing the night. You know, other than a few photo opportunities every year between the leaders, there really hasn't been much dialogue. The you know the positive aspect of this whole trade war is the fact that the two countries are really engaged in talking about very serious issues. And I think that what's going to come out of this is a much better relationship between the two countries. So, I mean, I, I don't want to imagine a world mm. where you have two camps. I don't really think, I think the Chinese leadership and people are pr pragmatic. I think the U.S. leadership is pragmatic. And I think that, uh, you know, it, it, as we resolve these issues, I think, well, you know, what you're going to have is the two countries really with a much better relationship. I understand, this. yeah, I understand that China does not want to replace the United States right. or anybody else as the world hegemon. Actually, China's State Council and Foreign Minister Wang Yi just made it clear in New York yeah. in a very important speech. But uh, uh, how is the, the United States going to react to China? I mean, I think at this moment, China is very much in the passive, you know, um, reactionary <laughs> state, whereas this, the United States, who's launching one card after next and, and, and charting its policy towards China, Jack, once again? Um, it's a very difficult question. <laughs> it is a very difficult question. I, I just believe that, look, I mean, you know, China's been developing over the, well, particularly since China joined WTO at the end of 2001. I mean, the economic and technological development has been tremendous to the point where people could start to think that okay, that is a threat. I think that, uh, and that's why, again, I think these discussions are helpful because over the last you know, number of years, people have always mentioned a lot of these issues they're talking about, like intellectual property and so forth. So it'd be nice to get these all kind of resolved and behind everybody because then the two countries mm. can go on to developing a much closer relationship. So again, you know, I've seen this over the years and there's always been these periods where there have been you know, many times when there are these periods of conflict or, of, you know, uh, argument between the two countries. But in the end, cooler heads have always prevailed. Mm. And, you know, the two countries have come back together. Yeah, Dr. Lee. Oh, sorry, Hannah, Hannah, you wanted to say well, something. I was, I was just going to add that, I, you know, I think what has been happening is there are certain issues which need to come out in the open. Yeah. Those issues are now mm -hmm. on the table and do need to be discussed. And they're not just issues that the US has raised or China has raised. These are issues that other countries also feel mm -hmm. quite strongly about, but perhaps don't necessarily have mm -hmm. the opportunity to talk about. And now here is an opportunity to talk about them and to resolve them, hopefully, for the future. So what, what do you think is the end game, though, the, the, you know, the distant future looming on the horizon where uh, China and the United States can exist, exist peacefully, coexist peacefully. But will the United States accept that? And African countries or Latin American countries or countries in other parts of the world will not have to be forced to, to, to pick sides. Because at this moment, it seems there are certain risks that they might find themselves in that kind of position. In what I think is then most important is to be able to listen to what the voices are coming from those other regions about what their perspectives are on the world's future development on these issues, whether it's intellectual property or whether it's you know, American uh, technology. These things are issues that other countries also have a perspective on. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, at the moment, we are looking at the world as if it's a bipolar world as if there's only two opinions. Well, actually, there are many other opinions, and we should use this opportunity to listen to those. Absolutely. Well, but the, the fact is the United States is definitely the most powerful country at this moment, and China looks like it's rising. We don't know how fast, how, how much more China is going to continue to develop, but mm -hmm. it is seen to be threatening the dominant position of the United States. So that's the, And no other single economy is able to do that. I mean, the European Union is also also quite important, but not mm -hmm. one single country within the European Union has the kind of mass, mass and uh, the kind of strength or say in international. That's why we're talking about the possibility of the world being 
being forced to polarize. Dr. Lee, what is your take on this issue? Yeah, uh, actually, for the United States and uh, China are all the members of uh, ASCAP, our parent organization. So we realize that uh, for the unpaid trade, not only for the get rid of the uh, tariffs and uh, any uh, other barriers, but also the stable relationship also very important. For the United, uh, United Nations, it's a good platform for all the uh, members to discuss what they are facing and what their thoughts and uh, uh, I think it's uh, inclusive and a cooperative uh, among different countries uh, would be very uh, is, uh, crucial for all the development of the uh, whole members. Will the United States continue to stay in this current system under this current umbrella given the kind of rhetoric we have been hearing Jack and if not um, do we, would you still be so optimistic? You stay under what system? I guess the UN, the international system that has been placed, been in place no, after think, the World no, War II. Yeah, the United States. Well, first of all, a couple of points. One is, I think the United States, you know, because of its capital markets, and because of the way the economy's developed over the years, you know, the United States keeps reinventing itself as new challenges get presented. And I think, for, you know, the country as a whole is quite confident and quite secure. I don't think they're worried about necessarily China overtaking the United States. I mean, clearly, uh, you know, just by the numbers, China's going to have a much larger economy than the United States. You multiply, you know, anything by 1.4 billion, you get a big number. Yeah. Okay, so I, I think the United States is quite secure about that. And I think if we can get some of these, you know, really kind of touchy issues kind of resolved one way or the other, I, I think we, you know, we can go on. But I, I don't think there's any uh, reason or any in, uh, initiative in the United States to really move away from organizations like the United Nations. I mean, I think the United States wants to make sure that it's looking for itself, you know, making take care, you know, of its own, mm -hmm. uh, you know, objectives and so forth. But that doesn't mean it doesn't want to be a, a good global player. So I hope not. I hope not. But from the what the President Trump and his administration has been talking about, um, there are at least some mixed pictures there. But Limited time left. I do want to, again, look at this um, timeline in front of us. <laughs> Going forward for the next 50 years, if we dare to give any advice or um, to shine light on the future path of China, what do you think China has to be careful about? Jack, then Dr. Lee, mm -hmm. then Hannah. I, I think, uh, you know, again, I think, you know, China, you know, a number of things. One is I think it has to develop its capital markets. I think the, the, the allocation of capital, I think, is one of the biggest, uh, you know, threats to China's continued development. So I think that's one thing you need to, you know, careful about. Clearly, uh, as China continues to grow economically, the impact on the environment, you know, continues to grow. And so China needs to think about, you know, think about that. But, you know, these are all challenges that are, that are well known. And I think, uh, as I see it, you know, the government in one way or another is already addressing. Hmm. Okay, so you are again optimistic. I am. I, no. <laughs> okay. I've been here 25 years, and I'll be here another 25. Good. Hopefully. I'm an optimist too. I believe you know people can change things by playing an yeah. active role and yeah. um, have hope. Um, Dr. Yes. Lee. Yes, uh, I think for Chinese development is a good news for the whole world. So uh, for the UN, uh, uh, United Nations, we uh, we should say China not only share the good practice with the other world, but also pay much attention to the three dimensions: social, economic, and environmental, uh, which leave no one uh, no one behind. So we could share our good practice to other uh, members uh, and also. We have very tough challenges to uh, get rid of the old poverty by 2020. Mm. So we could be strengthen the UN agencies and the Chinese government. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Hannah, uh, briefly. Well, very briefly. Uh, I, of course, rural poverty is get meant to get to zero by 2020. That's next year. Mm -hmm. uh, but obviously, there will still be challenges of urban poverty and so on uh, to deal with here in China. Mm -hmm. At, in terms of global role, I think China has an opportunity to, in a sense, reimagine what a global, large global player looks like and how it can give agency mm -hmm. to other countries, including through support for the UN, mm -hmm. but in a way that enhances the UN's ability to have voice and support uh, the yes. poorest countries in the world. Yes. Okay. That's true. Thank you very much. I hope we come back for this discussion in five to ten years' time and see whether we are on track. <laughs> Not very ambitious goal, but I think I think that's uh, we can do. We should do that. So many thanks to Jack Pukolski, to um, Dr. 
Yu Tong Li and to Hannah Ryder for joining me on this very special edition of The Point with me, Liu Xin. You can find me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle The Point with LX. Thanks for watching. You've got The Point.